Hey guys. This is Naruto x Star Wars. What if Naruto discovers a crashed starship and trained under the Sith Lord's spirit? Naruto discovers a crashed starship outside his village and his life is forever changed. Under the unorthodox tutelage of a Sith Lord's spirit, he will learn the technology and history of a larger galaxy that he, and no one else from his planet, ever knew existed. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. Chapter 1 A dark cloaked figure walked slowly down a long shadowed hallway. The surfaces of the hallway, the walls, ceiling, and floors were all made of metal. The hallway wasn't decorated or in any way elaborate, but rather cold and sterile. Passing by various doors, the man's thoughts wandered to the memories that he had of the place. Though he had been born on Naboo, he had spent years training and learning the intricacies of the dark side of the force in that very building. He remembered when his master had first offered him a chance to become something more than he could ever be alone. He remembered when that same man had become his master started his training. Darth Plagueis was his master's name, and in time Plagueis bestowed upon him the name of Darth Sidious. During his apprenticeship, every pleasure was denied, everything he loved was taken away, every fear he had was thrust upon him, and every weakness he had was taken advantage of by that same man. He always hated him for it, but that training had made him a powerful Sith. He had learned to immerse himself in the dark side of the Force. Learned to harness the power that the dark side held and to wield his emotions to his advantage without letting them control him. Plagueis had taught him everything that he knew. He was also given access to ancient teachings and writings that made him even more powerful as the years went on but things could no longer remain as they once were. Plagueis' obsession with mastering death was not something that he was previously concerned over. Nearly every Sith before his master had been obsessed with conquering death and extending their lives indefinitely. It was even something that he himself was concerned over but certainly not to the same degree as his master. Plagueis' research had changed over the years when he decided that the transference of one's essence did not appeal to him. The Sith Lord had therefore sought an alternative method which led to his research into the manipulation of midichlorians. Midichlorians were intelligent life forms that lived inside the cells of all living things. In beings with sufficient numbers present in each of their cells, they allowed for the detection and manipulation of the Force. Plagueis was originally experimenting with the manipulation of midichlorians through Sith alchemy in order to promote spontaneous cell growth. This could be used to prevent the cells in a being's body from deteriorating with age and even produce new cells which would extend a person's lifespan indefinitely. Sidious had been rather interested in these experiments as it would be preferable to extend a person's lifespan using these methods than to transfer the essence into a clone body every time the clone grew old. Despite having planned to kill his master for many years, Sidious was content to wait for Plagueis to finish the experiments. Plagueis would eventually teach him what was discovered through the research, and then he would kill his master and use the research to great effect. It was something that every master and apprentice of the their Sith order did. Eventually one would kill the other as was standard among the adopted rule of two. The master might kill the student and find another, better student, or the student might kill the master and replace him as Sith Lord and then start training an apprentice. It was necessary to keep their line going. Only the strong should survive and weakness was cut out as they moved toward their ultimate goal of the Sith ruling the galaxy. It was therefore obvious that Sidious noticed over the years that Plagueis had shifted focus from the primary goal of the Sith to focusing solely on his research. Sidious watched his master through hidden surveillance devices and monitored all activities. So it was easy to notice his master's complacency. Plagueis was no longer so concerned over the goals of the Sith or what Sidious was up to. Plagueis wasn't even aware that Sidious had recently taken a secret apprentice and was plotting against him. However, it wasn't until Plagueis began talking about creating new life with his research that Sidious truly became worried. Plagueis seemed determined to use his midichlorian manipulation technique to spontaneously create new life, specifically a child. Plagueis had theorized that a child born in that manner would have a greater midichlorian count a stronger force ability, and more powerful connection to the force than any other being. 
It was obvious to Sidious that if Playguys created such a child, then there would be no need for the current apprentice, and therefore his life might be in danger. Sidious felt threatened at the potential of that child. He became paranoid over what his master might be planning, and could no longer sit idly by and let his master finish the research. Did Playguys know about his secret apprentice? How long had his master been planning to replace him? Was his master one step ahead of him? Had Playguys been manipulating him into a false sense of security? All of these questions kept going through his mind, even when he tried to force them out. Thus, his prior planning would need to come to fruition much sooner than originally planned. He would kill Master Playguys as soon as he could. That was the reason for his current visit. Soon, soon I will take my rightful place and begin setting my plans in motion. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Were the sadistic thoughts going through the cloaked man's head as he smiled and continued making his way down the hall to his master's quarters. Sidious glided soundlessly through the dark throne room that his master always used into the adjoining personal chamber. All security measures in the facility had already been disabled. The few security droids in the building had also been deactivated. The stage was set for the final act with Playguys and his ascension from apprentice to master. Reaching into his black robes, Sidious removed a dagger from its hidden sheath. He had chosen a simple weapon in which to kill his master. Playguys always had a fascination with the arcane, and it would be fitting for him to be killed with such a simple weapon. The dagger wasn't a vibroblade but it was a strong curved blade, adorned with a large gem at the pummel and gold inlay along the blade with a comfortable handle. Sidious had planned out every detail extensively before this moment. He knew that he might not be able to face Playguys in real battle and remain unscathed. While Playguys may have become complacent with the goals of the Sith, the Mune's force ability, and knowledge of the dark side hadn't diminished. Playguys would have been a difficult foe for him. Perhaps too difficult. Therefore, Sidious had decided to rely on stealth and treachery to eliminate his master. He would arrive on the planet undetected and slip into the building without letting Playguys know he was there, which he already had. Then he would make his way to his master's chambers, which he was in, and open the door to proceed with his plan, which he was about to do. Reaching down to the control panel on the door, Sidious pushed the button to open it. The door opened almost instantly, and with far too much noise for Sidious liking but there was nothing he could do. If he used the force to open the door or cut it with his lightsaber, it would most likely alert Playguys. Sidious was after a victory with no fighting involved and he had to mask his force connection in order to escape detection by his master. Walking through the opening and over the threshold of the room, Sidious admired the objects and trinkets that his master had collected. Master Playguys always did have good taste. He passed through the main room without a sound and headed for the bedroom. There was no door linking the main room to the bedroom, just an open passageway. Entering the bedroom, Sidious couldn't help but produce an evil smirk at the sight of his helpless master. Of course he had already foreseen this moment several days ago, but he still liked the thrill of victory. His paranoia had been unfounded after all. Playguys knew nothing of his plotting. There was nothing his master could do to escape death. Approaching the bed, Sidious eyed his master one last time and decided on exactly where to stab with the dagger. Should it be once or multiple times? Should I aim for an area that will instantly kill him, or an area that will allow him to wake and see his killer? Debated Sidious gleefully as he enjoyed the power he had over his once great master in the moments before the act. He had never felt more alive. Sidious decided to aim for a fatal area with a single strike and allow Playguys to wake and see his murderer. He also wanted to see the reaction of the gray skin Mune and feel the life drain from him. Sidious only hoped he could finally see fear in the eyes that had denied him everything and made him feel inadequate. Lifting the dagger up, Sidious let the emotion flow through him. He felt rage, anger, passion, fulfillment, and a sadistic triumph. His smirking face altered. The mask that he wore as Palpatine fell to reveal a hideous twisted visage. The once smooth face was far paler than it had been. The smirk became an insane smile filled with cruelty. His eyes became a sulfuric yellow filled with nothing but malice. The emotions threatened to overtake him and he yelled out in triumph as he plunged the dagger into his master's chest. 
Sidious quickly removed the dagger a moment later and looked at the face of his master as he backed up slightly from the bed. Plague's eyes had opened and he was trying to figure out what was happening. Sidious could see the pain that his master was in and feel the mune's confusion, but didn't speak to him, only smiled with unrestrained delight at what he had done. A very brief moment passed before Plague's eyes widened as he realized what was happening. The mune attempted to sit up or move his body, but Sidious' strike had paralyzed him from the neck down. He then attempted to speak, but blood was already filling his lungs. With little option, Plague's focused on his attacker. The grayish skin master was slowly bleeding out and had little time left until he expired. For Sidious, he drank in his success over his master. He didn't get the fear that he wanted to see in his master's eyes, but the anger, conflict, despair, and disbelief that he could sense in the mune was more than worth the trade. Sidious' laughter rang out in the bedroom as he watched his master slowly expire, but Plague's wasn't dead yet. Calling upon the dark side of the force, Plague's attempted to fight back. When calling upon large amounts of the dark side, it was possible to heal injury without having any prior force ability in healing. Sidious' laughter stopped when he felt his master's buildup of dark side energy. Sidious yelled, and oh. And acting quickly, striking his master again with the dagger. After the second additional strike, Sidious stopped and looked once again into his master's eyes. They weren't the same eyes that he had seen before. They were no longer the eyes of a person realizing that death was upon them and contained something akin to amusement or laughter. The smallest hint of a smile adorned the mune's face as he slowly expired. A single sound came from Plague's as life left him, and it could only be described as a HN sound. Confused with what had just happened, Sidious tried to analyze what had caused these emotions in his former master. Answers came to him when he looked at his hand that was still holding the dagger. He was gripping the dagger as hard as he could and his hand was shaking uncontrollably. He also realized that his heart was beating rapidly, and his breathing was ragged. Searching his feelings, Sidious realized why Plague's had reacted like he had and sneered at the body of his dead master. He had shown his master fear. His master was paralyzed before him at his mercy and yet, at the slightest hint of Plague's fighting back, Sidious had become afraid and lashed out. Plague's had seen it, felt it and was, in a sense, amused at the weakness of his apprentice. It was humiliating and infuriating for Sidious. He couldn't believe his own weakness. Throwing the dagger to a corner of the room, where it hit with a loud clang, Sidious let loose his anger and frustration in the form of force lighting on his master's dead body. While the body was being burned beyond recognition, Sidious screaming out his frustration and rage in the bedroom of his former master. It was supposed to be a moment of triumph for him, Yet Plague's had turned it into a moment of humiliation that he would never be able to forget. Sidious emerged from the Lemurge power building and headed towards his ship which was on one of the landing pads connected to the main building. Before he left, he copied all of Plague's computer files onto a data card that he had with him. He also took his master's lightsaber and set one of the building reactors to overload. Sidious was confident that he already had all the Sith holocrons and texts that Plague's had so there was nothing else to take but the information on the data card and the lightsaber as a trophy. The building itself didn't actually matter to him, but he wanted to destroy it entirely and leave no evidence behind. Darth Plague's the Wise would be nothing more but a memory of another long-dead Sith Lord and he would never admit to being the Sith Lord's apprentice nor having an association with him. As the pilot droid took the ship off the landing pad and it began moving away from the building, Sidious watched as the building became smaller. Lemurge Power was a company that was founded and owned by the Sith after Darth Bane had started the new rule of two nearly a millennium ago. It was used as a cover to hide many of their various deeds in the galaxy over the centuries. This facility was rather old and no longer used by the Lemurge Power Company because the planet had already been stripped mined years earlier. The existence of this facility wasn't known to anyone because it was built and operated solely by droids, and no one would look for it or even notice that it was destroyed. Looking to the pilot droid, Sidious demanded to be taken to Naboo and let the droid work out the specifics on how to get there safely by hyperspace while the ship moved out of the planet's atmosphere. He was trying and failing to reapply his Sith mask, which was a Sith technique that, 
with great skill and concentration by the user, allowed them to not only hide any connection to the force but also change their appearance. As it required precise concentration, he was unable to perform the technique until he regained control of his emotions and managed to calm down. He had come to the planet expecting victory, but was ultimately leaving in defeat. He hadn't foreseen this part of his master's death. He only foresaw that he would kill his master. He attempted to meditate and forget about what had just transpired, but it would take time for him to be able to reach such a state. As the shuttle exited the atmosphere of the planet and entered hyperspace, part of the Lemurge building exploded on the surface of the planet. A very small explosion could actually be seen from space on the small planet, and there was no one to see it but there were however people who felt it. A rumbling that shook the entire ship was what awoke Doro Bias from his sleep. Doro was the owner of a YG-4210 light freighter which he named 42 and was currently working as a gunrunner. He had a crew of four which was all that he needed to run guns for Borvo the Hut, who controlled the local gun smuggling as well as many other nefarious things in the sector. The tremors worried him as his ship was rather old and also they weren't flying or even in space but sitting on the surface of an uncharted, uninhabited planet. Exiting his cabin, he quickly headed for the bridge. Several scenarios went through Doro's head as he sat down in the pilot's seat. He wasn't concerned about an attack considering that he had hid the ship rather well inside a canyon, but it was possible that whatever had woken him up was just as bad. They were waiting for a shipment of guns to arrive on the planet. The shipment would be more than they could carry in their freighter so they would hide the rest of the guns and transport what they could, then come back to transport the rest. Doro had many years of gun running under his belt and had used this particular planet for quite a while as a resting spot to hide and ferry guns. Most of the clients who bought the guns from Borvo were in the outer rim or mid rim, so having a planet to stash the guns that was right on the border of the two was quite beneficial. Checking the ship's scanner, Doro found that the scanners detected what looked like an explosion at or near the largest of the Lemurge power buildings on the planet. Doro knew about the buildings and left them alone because then no one would know he was using the planet. Most places didn't have that many security droids for being abandoned and the illegal mining operations had already ceased years prior. It was suspicious but Doro had no intention of investigating the building, at least until now. If one of those buildings had been damaged then the security droids might all be damaged too. He discerned and that meant that they could go scavenging before anyone from the merged power was able to come out and investigate. By the time someone did come, it would be too late, and they could damage the area more to make it appear like nothing was missing because it had been completely destroyed. His communications officer came into the cockpit to find out what was going on, and Doro told him to wake the rest of the crew. He may be cautious but he wasn't going to let an opportunity for credits pass him by. After setting down a good distance away from the building and sending out one of his men to scout on a small speeder bike, Doro and the remaining three crew members waited for news. The radio crackled several minutes later as the rest of crew sat or stood in the cockpit and waited for news, PSSSSD. I made it to the building. It's mostly destroyed but the top part seems partially intact. It looks like it just fell over after the blast. I'm not picking up anything on my scanner, and I don't see any security droids. Over, said the crewman. The rest of the crew broke out in smiles at what that possibly meant. It was time for scavenging. Doro radioed back, stay there, I'll bring 42 closer to the buildings. Over and out. Minutes later, 42 arrived on the scene and touched down near the building. Every crew member but the captain left the ship and started looking through the wreckage of the building. Doro stayed with his ship to monitor the sensors and if needed, start up the ship in a hurry and make a quick escape. He listened to the chatter of his men as they found different things to take back to the ship. His crew had found a small infirmary in one of the rooms and salvaged a medical droid as well as much-needed supplies. It seemed the bulleting was even outfitted with a back-to-tank, which was something that was far too expensive to even consider putting on his ship, but now they had one. 42's medical bay was rather understocked and the medical droid they had wasn't operating as well as it should be. Doro had more than one complaint about the deficient medical bay from the crew but now they would be set for quite a while. It wasn't until his men got to what they believed were offices that things started to get really interesting. There seemed to be a rather well-furnished apartment in the tower. 
whatever artwork and furnishing that his men were finding, he was sure he could sell to someone. Although Doro really didn't understand why a well-furnished suite would be inside what looked to be some kind of industrial plant, it was their benefit. Perhaps it's for a high-ranking officials when they visit, thought Doro, but that didn't make sense either as this planet wasn't important enough to warrant having any officials or executives and he was sure the plant itself hadn't been operational or producing anything for years. As the crewmen scoured the suite, one of the crew named Vox made his way into what he believed was the bedroom. While looking through everything that had been thrown around by the explosion and collapse of the tower, he noticed a small opening in the wall. The explosion must have shorted the locking mechanism for the hidden alcove and just opened it part of the way. He forced the panel open and greedily looked to see what he had found. Everything in the hidden compartment had been shoved to one side but he sifted through to find anything of value. He came across several items that looked like they could be worth something. A few old scrolls and tomes, an object shaped like a pyramid that fit in his hand, another object shaped like a cube that also fit in his hand and several small locked boxes. The boxes looked the most interesting as they were in containers that could take a beating and he couldn't get them open. If a person hides something in a secret compartment and then locks it away in a container, it must be worth something. Unsure of what items were valuable and what weren't, he decided just to take everything. Once the crew were done scrounging through the building and debris field, Doro flew the ship back to the meeting place for the arms shipment. They may have found some expensive items in the building, but he wasn't going to miss his shipment. If there was one thing that he learned doing business and smuggling with shady and dangerous people, it was that you don't keep them waiting or lose their shipments. Five days later. The ship is supposed to be near the Model system. Actual whereabouts, Uncone. Doro's eyes opened as he heard the unmistakable sound of blaster fire. He got up from his bed in the captain's cabin and quickly retrieved his heavy blaster pistol that he kept on the nightstand. His grogginess was quickly gone and he moved to the side of his cabin door and smacked the panel. The door opened almost instantly. While not exposing himself, he aimed the weapon ahead of him and peered around the doorway and into the adjacent hallway. If there was blaster fire, there was no way he was going to just run out into hallway. Moving into the archway of the door, he peered down the hallway. He couldn't see anyone. Had they been boarded? Pirates or raiders, maybe, he thought. They might be after his cargo as it was worth a hefty sum of credits. He couldn't hear much and there were no further sounds of a firefight, so he moved out of the doorway and crept silently down the hallway. He stayed to one side so he could use the bulkheads and walls for cover. Passing by the crew cabins, he found the doors open and the beds vacant. He finally made it to the ship's lounge and peered around the corner with his blaster aimed out in front of him. What he saw shocked and puzzled him enough that he paused. He saw Vox standing in the middle of the lounge while holding another one of the crew up in the air by the neck with just one of his arms. The man he was holding was turning blue, and Vox seemed to be smiling maliciously at the sight. Stepping out from the hallway, Doro said, Vox, what the hell are you doing? Vox turned towards him, but the man's ordinary green eyes were replaced with a sulfuric yellow that showed nothing but madness. With a twitch of his arm, Vox snapped the man's neck and then tossed him clear across the room. The dead crewman smacked into the inner hull with a terrible-sounding thud. What the hell's going on? Doro thought as he had just seen Vox throw another person across the room which was an incredible show of strength that he knew Vox wasn't capable of. Vox moved at Doro and the captain fired a shot at the man's chest. The blaster bolt hit and caused Vox to halt for a second. It was then that Doro noticed that Vox already had several blaster burns on his chest. The deranged crewman had already been shot more than once and most were fatal wounds. Vox seemed rather unfazed by the shot. He looked down and smiled, then looked back at Doro and charged him again. Oh shit! Doro thought and fired as many shots as he could. He wasn't really concentrating on aiming as he was too terrified of the situation to think straight. The pair collided and fell to the floor. For a moment nothing happened but then Doro shoved Vox's body off of him. He stared at the body as if it were going to come back to life. Two of his shots had hit Vox in the head, but he wasn't going to take any chances. Keeping his blaster trained on Vox's head, he used his free arm to help pull his body towards the wall to get off the ground. 
He wasn't injured but he wasn't going to take his eyes off of Vox's body. Once he was standing and steady, he debating about what to do. While looking at his presumably dead crewman, Doro finally noticed the necklace that Vox was wearing. He decided that it must have been part of what they scavenged from the planet where they got the guns several days ago. The necklace was actually glowing slightly but began to fade. Just looking at it however was giving him the creeps. Whatever that necklace is, it's bad news and I want it off my ship, he thought. Walking forward to Vox's body, he grabbed one of the legs and dragged the corpse to one of the escape pods. Locking the body in the pod made him feel much safer. Two of his crewmen were already dead but two were also unaccounted for so he began search the ship for the remaining crew. He hoped they were still alive. Unfortunately that wasn't the case. He soon found them both dead in other parts of the ship. One in the cargo bay and one near an escape pod. Doro moved their bodies into another escape pod as he really didn't have any other place to put them. The infirmary only had a single bed. Sitting down at a table in the lounge, Doro looked around the room, possibly expecting something else to jump out at him, but settled into the seat and tried to think about what to do next. He put his arms on the table and used them to rest his head on. Truly he had no idea what to do next. His entire crew was dead and his adrenaline was just now wearing off so the realization was just starting to hit him. What the hell happened to Vox? What was with that necklace? Are the rest of the things were took from that destroyed building just as bad? Dora wondered. He had heard many different tales from spacers of strange things happening during space travel. Finding weird objects with strange powers was a part of several stories that he heard, but he always just played those stories off as tall tales. Obviously now he knew different. He would have to get rid of all the items they salvaged, just to be sure. He also would make sure not to touch them in any way. Getting up from the table, he headed to the escape pod and jettisoned the one that Vox was in. The ship was equipped with more pods than they actually needed, so it wasn't a loss. Since they were still at hyperspace, whatever the hell that necklace was would never be able to get back to real space and never plague him again. Doro debated on whether or not to jettison the other pod as well. He knew that crew rather well and those four were some of the best he ever had. He decided to wait until he got to the shadow port on Seraphir, which was the planet that they were heading to with the gun's shipment. Seraphir was just one of the many names for the planet. It was in the Maudel sector and specifically used by gunrunners as a stopping point and hiding area. The ship should be there by now, he idly thought and headed to the cockpit. He rounded the corner of the hallway and noticed that the door of the cockpit was shut. That's odd. He thought and tried to open the door by pressing the adjacent control panel. The door didn't open. This was a definite problem as there was no one else on the ship but him, and it didn't make sense that the door would be locked. Ripping open the control panel, Doro tried to figure out what was wrong. It seemed that the door was locked from the inside but that didn't make any sense. The only other possibility was that someone had tampered with the locking mechanism on the inside to lock when the door was shut. Cursing, Doro tried to everything he could to get the door to unlock but it didn't work. Heading for the machine room, he searched for the fusion cutter. Once he had finished cutting out a portion of the door, Doro slammed his shoulder up against it and forced the portion of door he had cut to fall inwards where it slammed onto the floor. The cockpit was big enough that the door didn't hinder him from getting in. He jumped in the pilot's seat and first determined what the status of the ship was. He looked over all the instrumentation and performed a diagnostic. The ship was fine but they were running low on fuel. It shouldn't be a problem though. The ship should be close to our destination and we can refuel there. Doro thought as he went to check the navigational computer to make sure they were still on course. He looked at the screen and thought perhaps he was reading it wrong. He checked it again but couldn't believe what he was seeing. The ship had already passed their destination. It had then continued on and was now well into the unknown region of space. What the hell was the only thought running through his mind. Doro spent over an hour checking the navigational computer to determine if it was working correctly. It was working fine. He then checked all navigational logs to determine how in five days they could have traveled so far. The trip to Seraphir along their specific route should have taken no less than five days and yet the ship had traveled more than one and a half times that distance in the same amount of time. 
Looking through the logs he saw numerous course corrections that he knew weren't made by him. The course that they actually traveled to Serfro was far different than the course they usually took and the one he had plotted five days ago. It turned out that the new route was much faster and they actually reached Serfro over a day ago but didn't stop. It was obvious that the culprit was Vox, especially with what happened earlier. The man had obviously been possessed by something and then altered the ship's course. Instead of stopping at their intended destination, a new course had been plotted to somewhere else but Doro had no idea where the ship was now going. Was it just a random course that led to nothing or was there something at the end of that course? He didn't know which was worse. The unknown region was how it sounded. It wasn't mapped and no one really knew what was there. The main reason why no one ever went there was due to a hyperspace disturbance that spanned the border of known space and the unknown region. It made travel extremely difficult, time-consuming, and dangerous, so few ever tried. The region would be like trying to plot a course through an unknown maze. The ship would have to keep stopping and changing course, and it was difficult to say what was really out there. A ship could fly too close to something and be destroyed. It was dangerous and spacers stayed away from it. There could be entire civilizations living in secret out in that area of space or nothing at all. No one knew for sure. Staying away, however, wasn't an option as he was already traveling in it. The real problem that Doro discovered was that he didn't have enough fuel to make it back to known space. They had enough fuel to reach Serifer and although they had gotten there faster, the ship only had a specific amount of fuel left and it had already passed the point of no return. The navigational system was also locked for whatever destination they were heading. The ship was jumping through hyperspace and stopping whenever it encountered an obstacle. It would then readjust coordinates and jump back into hyperspace. Basically it was moving on a preset autopilot, and while Doro knew a great deal about his ship, he never tried to mess with the navigational computer in such a way. He was locked out from something that Vox had most likely done, and he couldn't change course. The best that he could do was shut down the hyperdrive but that meant that he would just be stuck in uncharted space. Since the fuel was low, that meant that it was only a matter of time before the ship's power was shut down, which included life support. It was a situation that he never wanted to find himself in, nor did any spacer for that matter. The most that he could hope for was that the ship would stop at a habitable planet before jumping again, and he would be able to get off the ship in one of the remaining escape pods. He didn't want to admit it, but this was the only option that he had. Doro packed everything that he could into one of the escape pods. He didn't bother touching any more of the items they had found. He only had to wait a few hours for the ship to exit hyperspace again, and he scanned the surrounding area for a habitable planet using the sensors in the escape pod. He was lucky that there was one habitable planet in a nearby system that he could reach. Hitting the jettison button, he was launched away from his ship along with a second escape pod with his other three crew members in it. As the pods moved away from the ship, he looked at it one last time through the window on the pod before it re-entered hyperspace. With the ship deeper in the unknown region. The ship followed the plotted course for some time after Doro had left the ship. It had just come out of hyperspace as it had encountered a gravity well, which turned out to be an entire solar system. It tried to make another jump to hyperspace, but the system encountered an error as it didn't have the necessary fuel or power to make another jump. Slowly, the ship drifted towards one of the planets in the system and was caught by its gravitational field. It was a stormy night in Kanahagakur no Sato. The raining was heavy and lightning flashed across the sky with loud thunder following each flash. Ninja were advised not to patrol in the village or on the wall because of the danger of being struck by lightning. They stayed in the guard posts along the walls but they weren't really paying attention to what was happening outside. Not a single person in the village noticed what looked like a shooting star that night. It fell from the sky but was mostly obscured by the clouds and rain. The thunder also masked its impact. The ship's computer registered a crash. The escape pods had already been jettisoned so it shut down every system in order to conserve power remaining power and automatically activated the ship's emergency beacon. Seven years later, current year is 43 BBY. During this time skip, 50 BBY Darth Sidious takes Maul to the Jedi Temple to watch the Jedi. It is one of Maul's earliest memories. 
48 BBY Uzumaki Naruto is born, so at this current time he's 5 years old. 46 BBY Padme Amidala born. A 5-year-old Naruto peeked around the corner of a building to check and see if the coast was clear. He was wearing black shorts and a white shirt with a red spiral. He only saw a few people walking down the darkened streets, which was good for him. He tried his best to keep to the shadows and stay out of sight as he looked for anywhere that would be safe to hide. Despite being treated nicely by a select few individuals, the majority of the village greatly disliked him, and he had no idea why. For years he had wanted to know why the villagers looked at him like they did, and why he was so hated in the village. Just recently he had resolved to stop crying over it. He started putting up a fake smile when walking around the village and declaring how he was going to be Hokage when he would hear their whispers. He wanted to show the entire village that they were wrong about him. He smiled until his face hurt, but it never made him happy, and he proclaimed things until his throat was dry but it never made him feel any stronger or that he had accomplished anything. It was during a visit to the Hokage's office that he was informed of the existence of other villages and was shown a map of the elemental nations. From that point onward he had gotten in his head that perhaps there was a nicer place outside his current village, where people did not give him such looks. Expanding on this thought, he began exploring the village, going out further and further from his apartment towards the tall village walls. They were a barrier that he was not allowed to cross as evident when he tried and was taken back to the Hokage Tower. What laid beyond the wall, he wasn't sure but the fact was that some were allowed through and people were constantly entering or exiting while he could not, was something he found very strange. Why would they prevent some people such as himself from leaving while allowing others? This made him all the more curious about what was beyond the imposing rock. Reaching one of gates to leave the village, Naruto slowed his pace and tried not to be seen. Looking around, he noticed that very few people were in the area and the gate guards seemed to be sleeping. He thought about the situation and decided to go for it. He would probably be safer outside the village than inside, and he could come back in the morning. Despite never actually leaving the village before, he got up from his spot and ran for the gate. Some people saw him but few paid any attention as he ran. Making it to the gates, he ran straight through them and kept running down the dirt path. He wasn't sure where he was going but he knew that for the time being, the unknown would be better than what he was leaving behind in the village. Eventually he decided that he couldn't go too far away from the village as he might never be able to find his way back, so he cut into the forest and tried to keep the village walls or even the Hokage monument in view. Making his way through the trees, he tried to stay far enough away from the village that he didn't have to worry about getting spotted by a guard on the wall. Naruto stopped every now and then as he looked for a place to hunker down and ride out the rest of the day. He wanted some kind of shelter but he'd only found trees and prickly brush so far. It was interesting to be outside of the village, but he thought it would be different. He thought that the trees would be different, or the grass and plants, but they were all the same. It was a little disappointing and he wished to see something exotic, or at least more interesting than constant green. After an unknown amount of time, he slowed down to a very slow walk. He wasn't tired but he did notice that he couldn't see the village wall anymore. He would have thought more about it if he hadn't have tripped over a root. His little stumble proved far worse than he thought it would as he was standing near the top of a steep slope and didn't even know it was there. He ended up rolling end over end down the slope. Through what little he could see between interchanging hard ground and sky, he found that the slope had a drop off to it. Panicking, he managed to reach out and snag part of a bush to stop him from falling. Looking down from his precarious position, Naruto saw about a twenty-foot drop to the surface of a lake that was beneath him. It wouldn't have been so bad, however he had no idea how to swim. The bush was still holding his weight so he tried to pull himself up with it but it started to give so he stopped. He then tried to grab the ledge but years of erosion had left it mostly dry and loose soil so he couldn't get a firm grip to pull himself up. Everything he touched just kept on crumbling. Naruto then tried to get some traction on the soil with his feet but it was rather sheer and had no footholds. His movements did however cause the bush he was grabbing on to snap and he plummeted to the water. Naruto yelled out before he hit the water. The cold water was a shock to his system and the height of the fall caused him to sink down into the lake several feet. He had fallen in back first but his body twisted upside down. 
He was about to start struggling when he saw something. He couldn't see the bottom of the lake, but in the darkness a blinking light stood out in sharp contrast. It was red and flashed intermittently. The light immediately caught and held his attention, so much so that he forgot about the situation he was in until he felt the need to breath. Taking his attention away from the light, Naruto struggled to get to the surface. He kicked and flailed his arms until he finally started showing results and moving towards the surface. He was only able to get a single ragged breath before he went back under the surface. Realizing how difficult it was to try and stay on the surface, Naruto attempted to move himself closer to the wall face. He called for help several times while struggled to stay above the surface but no one could hear him. He expended quite a bit of energy to get to the wall but it was worth it as the surface at that level was rocky and had enough roughness to it for him to grab on and pull his head above the water surface. After taking many deep breaths of air, Naruto shimmied across the rock face while still in the water until he made it to the opposite side of the lake which was mostly trees. Pulling himself onto the grassy shore he panted and lay there for a while to catch his breath. Despite the traumatic experience, he couldn't help but think that about that flashing light. He wanted to know what it was. Only one obstacle was in his path though, he needed to learn how to swim. The next day several porcelain masked ninja found Naruto outside of the village and brought him to the Hokage. Naruto relayed his story to the Sandame that he wanted to see what was beyond the wall, though he left out the light, and asked if he could learn how to swim saying that he never wanted to experience such a thing again. The Hokage was glad that the boy was alright and though angry at the gate guards. Far too young to learn chakra control and water walking, the Sandin promised to get Naruto a teacher to learn the basics of swimming later in the week, as long as the boy promised to stay inside the village. He was glad that Naruto hadn't been too affected by the experience. Similar experiences with drowning usually left a child with a fear of water in general. Naruto was thrilled about the swimming practice but his mind was still on the flashing light. In that moment he had no idea how much it would change the rest of his life. Chapter 2. The Ship A few weeks after the previous chapter, Naruto managed to sneak out of the village again. It wasn't really as hard as he thought it would be. He imagined that the gate guards would ask questions or something but the ninja sitting in the booth at the gate really didn't care. Making his way back to where the ANBU had found him, Naruto again found the lake that he had fallen into several weeks earlier. He had spent nearly all his free time since then learning to swim and practicing. He even practiced holding his breath in his tub. After initially learning how to properly swim, he then practiced diving as he would need to dive down pretty far to determine exactly what the blinking red light was. He wasn't sure how deep the lake was but he prepared as best as he could for this moment. Taking off his clothes, he was left in a pair of bright orange swimming trunks. Looking over the area, he found it looked very different from what he had remembered. He decided to swim over to the cliff that he had fallen off of, rather than try and jump off of it again. It took a while to get adjusted to the water as it wasn't very warm but he managed. He had brought a glow stick with him so that he could see better when he was diving. It was currently in his pocket. Getting in position near where he had fallen off the cliff weeks previously he tried to prepare himself for his dive and began a few breathing exercises while keeping his legs moving and himself above the surface. A few memories of his previous near-death experience went through his mind but he tried to put them behind him. He really wanted to find out what was causing that light. There were many different lights in Konoha but why would someone put one way out here, outside of the village, and in a lake? There were so many questions that he just couldn't get out of his head, and he believed they would never leave until he finally found the answers are for himself. There was a good chance that whatever he would find was going to be a disappointment, or that he would dive down and the light would be gone but he was still determined to try. Taking two quick breaths in and out, he took one last breath in before he went under. His plan was to circle the area until he caught sight of the light. If he didn't see it then he would have to start diving down randomly to find out if whatever he saw was still at the bottom of the lake. It actually didn't take long for Naruto to spot what he was after. It turned out that the light was still working perfectly, and he could see it just as well as before. Naruto swam towards the blinking light but he had some trouble judging just how far away it was. Before he had reached it, he was already out of breath and had to surface. Once reaching the surface, 
he took another quick few breaths and dove in again. This time he was determined to find what was there. Diving as best as he could, he neared the light and was finally able to make out what it was. What he found confused him. It was a long piece of metal that was sticking up off of what he assumed was the lake bed. The light was affixed to the metal on a small offshoot from the main rod. He inspected it as best as he could before he needed to get back to the surface for air. Naruto floated on the surface of the water while he contemplated what he had found. It was a blinking light and it was underwater, but he didn't actually know what it was a part of and what it was doing there. The bottom of a lake seemed like such a weird place to put a light, and he questioned why was it blinking in the first place. All the lights that he knew didn't blink unless they needed to be replaced. The rod that it was affixed to seemed familiar in some way, but he really couldn't place it. Naruto took another couple of breaths before diving down in the water again. This time he would find out where the rod was coming from. Swimming farther than he had before, Naruto ignored the light and grabbed the metal rod, allowing him to pull himself deeper than he had gotten before. Reaching the bottom of the lake, he took his free hand and tried to dig into the mud only to find that it was less than an inch thick and his hand encountered a very hard surface. Pushing the mud away he uncovered more of the surface. The rod was attached to this surface but Naruto was unable to gather any more information as he had to get more air. Diving back down again, he tried to determine just how far this hard surface extended and used his glow rod to help him see. At least two hours of diving later, Naruto discovered that the surface that the light was attached to was completely metal and was rather large. It was somewhere around 20 to 30 meters long and had various interesting features along the surface. It had a big dish, a large prong device, and several different shapes and irregularities. One side had several cylinders attached to it, and Naruto had no idea what they did, or what any of it did for that matter. He couldn't believe that he had found something so cool. Naruto had never seen so much metal in one place before and the fact that it was all part of a single object was incredibly to him. How in the world could someone have forged it? Was a thought that kept going through his head. Other questions soon followed. What was it for? What did it do? Did it belong to the village or somebody else? What was it doing in the water? Were just some of those questions. Those questions however came to a halt on his final dive when he found glass at one end. There were several large pieces of glass and Naruto could even see inside. Whatever the object was, it looked hollow. He could see several seats inside but only darkness beyond that. He could also see a flashing red light on the inside that was the same color as the one on the metal rod. The main question that went through Naruto's mind now was, how do I get inside? Naruto made his way back to Konoha before it got dark. He hadn't told anyone about what he had found and he didn't want anyone to find out about it. It was rather difficult to keep a secret like that when he wanted to blurt it out to everyone but he had his reasons. If it was a discovery then it would be his and his alone. He just had to find out what it was that he had discovered and if it was something of importance. He really hoped that it wasn't something that everyone already knew about. Sighting down at his dining room table, he took out his pencils and some paper and tried to draw whatever it was that he had found. The drawing came out looking like a gardening spade with cylinders attached to the handle but from what he had seen, that was somewhat accurate. He wasn't sure what mysteries would be revealed by putting down what he had found on paper but it gave him a better understanding of where everything was and how it looked from a bird's eye view. It was obvious at some point when he was diving that Kanoha didn't have anything like what he had found. It was like some type of solid metal tube or something. Maybe a house, as it was definitely bigger than his apartment. But why were those chairs facing the window? He thought as it still didn't make much sense to him. He picked up one of his chairs and brought it into the bedroom. Placing it facing towards the balcony he sat in the chair and stared out of the open balcony. It was a slightly similar setup as the object had. What would this accomplish? He wondered. The object was underwater so there was no view or really anything to see. The chairs were all facing forward so it wasn't some kind of meeting room. The only conclusion that he could come up with was that the object was not meant to be underwater but rather somewhere with a view. He thought about it being a boat but he had never heard of one that was completely made of metal, that didn't have a sail, or that couldn't float. A pretty useless boat it must have been, and why would a large boat be doing in a lake that was miles from the ocean? 
He just couldn't think of anything else that it could be that made any sense. He could have stopped in to see Hokage Gigi about it, but he wasn't sure he wanted to. It was something that he wanted to figure out by himself, and he didn't want anyone to know yet. If they knew, they might try to take it away from him or claim credit for finding it. It was painfully obvious that few people in the village liked him. They gave him cold glares, all the time. If whatever it was that he had found was valuable, they might claim that he hadn't found it or didn't deserve it. Naruto always had trouble with money because most places would charge him more than what the items were worth but if he made a lot of money off this discovery, then he could buy whatever he wanted. In around a year he would be joining the academy, and he would need all the basic ninja supplies and academy supplies, in addition to anything else that would help him and his ninja career. He was finally getting tired so he decided to get ready for bed. Naruto thought about everything that had happened that day as he tried to fall asleep. It's not that he wasn't tired but his mind just kept coming up with different scenarios about the object. What it could be, what it could bring him, and how his life might change for the better because of it. The next day Naruto slept in, mostly because he had so much trouble falling asleep. The only thing that he had thought of while trying to fall asleep was that, whatever the object was, it was made for people to be inside it. Based on that thought, he came to a logical conclusion from thinking of his apartment, it must have a door for them to enter and exit. When he finally did get up, he cursed as he had nearly wasted the entire morning and he had a lot of work to do. He had to reinspect the entire object and look for a door or some kind of opening. He didn't want to try and break the glass because then all the water would fill into the object. However, if there was a door, then water would fill into it anyway so he kept that as plan B. He quickly got dressed and ate his usual three bowls of ramen. Making his way out of the village, he headed back to the lake. Naruto had inspected most of the ship without finding what he was looking for. He didn't really know what kind of door there would be and since he hadn't found any knobs or any evidence of a door, perhaps he had been mistaken. However, even with this doubt he was still determined to find something and continued his search. Most transport ships of that size had several different openings, that Naruto had no idea about. They had two docking rings on either side of the ship, an access ramp, and possibly a freight elevator or even a ceiling-slash-top hatch. The docking rings didn't look like any opening Naruto had ever seen so he paid them no attention and he wouldn't have been able to open them anyway. The access ramp was on the underside of the ship along with the fright elevator so he wouldn't have been able to even see them or get gain entry through them. Naruto finished inspecting the backside of the object. He had thoroughly looked at the large cylinders to see if they had an opening but the object was completely solid and nothing on it would give. After going back to the surface for air, he started inspecting the spade part of the ship when he found a raised circle of metal. A metal band was raised several inches above the area around it while the center of the circle was lower and completely smooth and flat. He took notice of it because the area in the circle had a seam running down the middle. He tried to grab or get his fingers into the seam in the metal but he couldn't. Grabbing onto the raised ring of metal to keep himself from floating back to the surface, his finger depressed some kind of button. The seam in the metal opened immediately and Naruto was sucked inside the now open circle along with the water around him. Everything was pitch black and Naruto couldn't tell whether he was upside down or not. He was panicking and he was reaching the point when he needed air. Extending his arms outward he groped in the dark and tried to feel his way around but found that he was in some kind of tube. He tried the ends of the tube but the opening he had come through was shut and the both ends were solid. He was trapped. His eyesight slowly adjusted to the dark, only to confirm what he already knew. The tube was only about three feet wide and completely filled with water. He found where he had come through and frantically looked for a switch or some kind of button to let him out and back to the surface for air. He however stopped when a faint blue light filled the tube. Turning his body, he saw that it was emanating from a small square on the wall. Not a moment later, a strange noise filled the tube. Naruto tried to determine where it was coming from but couldn't. He was surprised and thankful when the water in the tube started to lower. Naruto quickly swam to the top of the water which was slowly dropping and took a much needed breath of air. The tube continued to drain until the water was gone and Naruto was left drenched but alive and sitting on the floor of the tube breathing heavily. 
When it was finished, the blue light turned off and almost instantaneously, part of the tube opened. Naruto stared out from the tube into blackness. He was hesitant to move from the tube and waited for an unknown amount of time to see if anything else happened. Everything was quiet and both inside and outside of the tube. Naruto shivered as he was still wearing just his swim trunks and still drenched while sitting on a cold metal floor. He decided that he would have to exit the tube and try to find a blanket or else he might freeze. Even his enhanced night vision had trouble seeing very far ahead of him. Everything was pitch black and he could make out only a few feet outside of the tube. Getting up, he stepped forward to the opening and peered out. He couldn't see that much farther ahead of him and really couldn't make any shapes out in the dark. The air outside smelled rather stale. Naruto started shivering and decided that he had to do something. He took one step outside the tube and instantly something happened. It started with a low hum, and then lights started blinking before they fully turned on. Naruto jumped back into the tube. His senses were completely alert, and his heart was racing. Was someone there? They must have heard him and turned the lights on. Was he in trouble? Were several of the thoughts going through his mind? However, nothing happened. He waited as long as he could but nothing else happened. No voices, no other sounds besides a low hum of the lights and no footsteps. Peering out again he looked around the now illuminated room. It had many containers of varying size. Most of them were knocked over but some were still stacked. Several were opened and some contents strewn around the floor. He also noticed a metal device on the far side of the room but he had no idea what it was. It looked like it had a seat on it and handlebars. The room was large and had two openings that lead into darkness as only the lights in the room he was in had turned on. Is anyone here? Why did the lights turn on? He wondered but he didn't want to shout out because he could be trespassing. After making sure that no one was around, he walked out of the tube and more thoroughly examined the room. The walls were metal, the ceiling was metal with various pipes and wiring, and the floor was metal too. It all seemed so strange to him. Picking one of the directions to go in, he stepped up to the opening and peeked into the partial darkness. He could make out what appeared to be a hallway but he couldn't see very far as the darkness shrouded most of it but he could make out a faint red blinking in the darkness. Remember the windows and what he had seen through them, he believed that this was that blinking light. He moved into a hallway without thinking about it and the lights again turned on as soon as he went through the entryway. He was startled again and waited for a moment but nothing else happened. Deciding to continue, he slowly walked down the hallway and stayed to one side so that he could try and hide if needed. He also kept looking back the way that he came to make sure that he wasn't being followed. He didn't have to go far before coming across two metal doors and a ladder. One side of the hallway had a ladder and a door while the other had just one door. He looked down and up the ladder and saw something but he wasn't sure exactly what it looked like. It seemed to lead to a small room but it was too dark to tell. Going beyond that, he came to another pair of rooms on either side of the hallway. The one side had seating and a large table with chairs while the other just had some more storage. Moving along, Naruto eventually came to an intersection. Both directions lead to something but his attention was drawn to the blinking light ahead which now brighter than it had been. He continued forward until he came to an odd door. It looked uneven and a large and thick piece of metal was lying on the floor. Something on the wall next to the door had been ripped open and exposed several wires. He entered the final room along the hallway and just like the other rooms, the lights came on. Just like he saw from the outside while looking through the windows, there were several chairs. Two were facing forward towards the window while two others were positioned at an angle and faced some of the window. Moving over to the chair with the blinking light he examined what was there. Besides many different switches and buttons and a bunch of other stuff which he couldn't identify, there was one button that had the red blinking light above it. Without really thinking, Naruto reached out and pushed the button beneath the light. It turned the light off and nothing else happened. That was disappointing. He thought and shivered again. Walking out of the room he decided to explore the intersection. He chose one direction and followed it to four doors, two of which were open. Looking inside he could see alcoves for bunk beds in both rooms. Each room apparently was for two people and had a desk, what he assumed were closets or lockers, and a door to possibly a bathroom. 
Naruto moved into the room and ignored the light turning on as he went right for the blankets on one of the beds. He wrapped himself in them and tried to regain his warmth. After what Naruto believed to be an hour, he had warmed up enough to stop shivering and find something to wear. Naruto got out of the bed and rifled through the closets. He found some socks and put them on but the boots he found were much too big so he put on a second pair of socks over the first pair. He borrowed a shirt and put that on and didn't bother looking for pants. The shirt was long enough that it nearly went down to his knees and almost covered up his swim trunks. Exiting that room, he went to examine the other rooms. It seemed that only two had ever been used and the other two he went in, after figuring out how to open the doors, seemed to be used for storage. He left this area and went back to the main hallway and the intersection. Going down the hallway that he didn't take earlier, he found two rooms that were much larger than the others. They each had a larger desk, a sitting area, and a bed. Naruto didn't look through what was there because he wasn't sure if anyone was currently living there or not. Upon examination, one room was rather messy and it looked more empty than any of the others. The closet was empty and things were strewn about as if someone left in a hurry. Making his way back down the hallway he went to the two doors and the ladder. One door turned out to lead to a bathroom, and he climbed up and down the ladder to find a chair with some handles and a screen. He really didn't know what they did so he left them alone. Naruto went to the panel on the other door and pushed the button to open it. No sooner did it open than he saw something in Kaiko. You hid along the wall of the hallway and out of sight. When nothing happened, he peered back in and saw what he did the first time the outline of a person and a table. The person wasn't moving and looked to have their head bowed. Not taking his eyes off the person, he stuck his hand into the room and moved it around, working on the theory that the lights turned on when someone walked in. The lights hummed to life and revealed what looked like a piece of metal armor. It was gray in color and had a helmet and everything. The table was longer than it was wide and there was a glass tube on one side of the room with many cords and cables running to it from an open panel on one of the walls. He saw several instruments and devices which he did not recognize as well as boxes that filled up the room. Naruto calmed down as he looked closely at the armor. It had thin arms and legs which Naruto found odd for a piece of armor and made him wonder how a person could properly wear it with those pieces attached the way they were. It also had a strange mask with a tube coming from it. He stared at it for a while before he decided that it was too weird and he didn't want to look at it anymore. He shut the door and decided to stay away from that room and finish exploring the rest of the object. Walking down the hallway to where he first entered though that tube, this time, he went in the other direction that he didn't choose. He found it slightly disappointing that it didn't go very far. The opposite end of the hallway led to a couple of storage rooms, one room that had many seats but was empty, three doors that wouldn't open and seemingly led out into the water, and a single large room that had several devices and reminded him of the large cylinders that he had seen while swimming around outside. He went back to the room with the table in it and sat down in one of the chairs. Thinking about everything, he came to several conclusions. The first conclusion was that no one was there. The second was that he still didn't know exactly what the object was. It seemed to be some kind of capsule-like home, but he still couldn't think of a purpose for it. The third conclusion was that it didn't appear as if anyone had been there for a while. The air smelled old, and it seemed that someone who had been there had left, possibly in a hurry. The fourth and final conclusion was that since he discovered it, and whoever had owned it had possibly abandoned it, then it now belonged to him. Seeing as he believed that the object was now his, he set about looking through everything on it in detail. He started going through all the containers that he could find in the large storage room. He found several different devices which he could not identify, clothing, what looked like survival kits, many different packages with writing and labels that he couldn't read, and what he thought were medical supplies or something of that nature. He did find a few interesting things though, and put them aside in a separate pile for him to further inspect later and take with him. Naruto looked through the room farthest from the glass and chair room but only found what appeared to be tools. Passing by and ignoring the really strange room he went to the bedrooms again. He looked at the smaller sets of rooms first. The less used rooms had some storage, but none it was very interesting. It wasn't until he got to the used bedrooms that he found the interesting stuff. 
An assortment of weapons were part of the contents of the closets as well as several dirty magazines and clothing. The weapons were mostly knives but a few had some kind of handled metal device. Naruto assumed they were weapons as they were placed in holsters that were attached to a belt. He had no idea how it worked though but wanted to find out. Before Naruto could fatally shoot himself with one of the blasters, his gaze shifted completely as he noticed a few trinkets at the bottom of one of the closets. They were partially buried under some clothes but a shine of metal caught his eye and he put the device he was holding down and went to look at the new objects. Removing the clothes, he found a few books, some boxes, and two oddly shaped objects. He ignored the books and went right to the objects. The first was a cube that had metal on the edges and the same metal design on each side with blue glass filling in the rest of each side. He thought it looked like a piece of stained glass and inspected it thoroughly. The second was a pyramid that was nowhere near as nice as the first shape, so he didn't touch it. It had two types of metal with different etchings and symbols carved into it. The three other items that he had found were metal boxes. He opened one to find that it was empty, which was rather disappointing. He tossed the box over his shoulder and went on to the next one. The second box was larger and more rectangular than the other two but locked so he couldn't get it open. There didn't appear to be a keyhole but several small buttons with unrecognizable symbols on each. Naruto thought it could have been a type of combination lock or something but he wasn't sure. The third box was open like the first box but it was far from empty. Naruto's eyes widened as he saw the gold necklace that the box contained. It was some type of golden ornament on a gold chain. He lifted it into the air to inspect it and found that it was a little heavy and smiled at how much money he might be able to get from it, especially if it was solid gold. He had heard stories about treasured and buried chests, and now he had found some. Naruto picked up the necklace from the box and put it around his neck. It was rather heavy but that just made him think of the larger stacks of Rio that it would bring him. He bundled all of the other smaller items together in a blanket so they would be easy to carry and started going through all the other rooms. An hour or so later, Naruto had packed up several things that he had wanted to take with him. He was however confused as to how he would get them out of the ship without ruining them in the water. It was during this contemplation that he first noticed that he wasn't feeling very well. He ignored it at the time because he had just found a backpack that would hold all of the items that he wanted to take with him, and it actually looked to seal shut and possibly be watertight. While he was happy at his discovery, the feeling of illness made itself known again. It started as a headache, which he seldom got, about half an hour before but he didn't pay it any attention. He noticed that he was feeling muscle aches while he was packing all of the things into the backpack. It was when he was putting the pyramid-shaped object into the backpack that he stopped as he felt warmth run down his top lip. Naruto wiped his nose and found that he was bleeding. He had nose bleeds before but never this much blood and it usually involved him picking his nose beforehand. Naruto was rather confused as to what was happening. It was only then did he realize how dizzy he felt. Having no idea what was going on, Naruto started to panic. When he tried to stop the blood flow from his nose, he felt warmth coming from beneath his eyes. Checking his cheeks, he found blood there as well. Why were his eyes now bleeding? Naruto fell to one knee as he started coughing and felt pain in his chest. He covered his mouth but when he removed his hand, he noticed that there was blood on it too. He was hyperventilating now but had no idea what he could or should do. For the most part, he froze. As his symptoms got worse, he suddenly had the feeling that the necklace was causing this. Despite having no idea where that thought came from, Naruto still followed it. He took off the necklace which now felt rather hot and threw it away. Once it was removed, he did feel slightly better but he was still bleeding and coughing up blood. It now seemed to be coming out of his ears too. Another thought came to him, which was to go to the room that he hadn't wanted to go back to. For some reason he had the feeling that he might be saved if he went there. Bracing himself against the wall, he stumbled down hallway to the room. He managed to make it to the door and hit the button on the panel to open the door. He stumbled into the room but managed to grab the table to keep himself from falling. The only word he could get out was, help, before he collapsed to the floor. He let go of the pyramid-shaped object when he fell and T.I. landed on the floor near the droid. Had he not been losing consciousness, 
he would have been surprised by the fact that he had still been holding it. A moment later, the photoreceptors of the medical droid lit up. It found an injured boy on the ground and quickly went to work. The disembodied spirit of Darth Plagueis watched as the medical droid placed the child into the Bacta tank. He appeared as a dark apparition above his holocron. After being killed by his apprentice, his spirit had not gone over to the other side. His research and experiments into cheating death had allowed his spirit to remain in the world of the living after the death of his physical body. He had quickly analyzed the situation and attached himself to his holocron, which he had a connection with, and which was hidden away in a secret alcove in his chambers. He quickly found that he had very limited abilities but could affect the physical world with his force powers. After the reactor was destroyed he had no idea how long he would have to wait until he would be found. He knew about the minor weapon smuggling operations on his planet but didn't know someone was there and were quick to arrive. He purposely unlocked the secret panel which hid some of his most secret possessions so that his holocron would be found as he was not able to move the holocron that he was now attached to. Though he had no idea how he would accomplish it, Plagueis had begun plotting revenge against his apprentice for killing him and completely disrupting his work only a few minutes after the death of his body. His recent breakthrough on midichlorian manipulation was almost forgotten in his anger. He hadn't counted on the scavengers breaking open the locked boxes that he had. They were locked for a reason as the contents were rather powerful and dangerous, even to himself. At the time he had no way to stop them as he had only recently been a spirit and had no control over his form. The crewman had opened the first box and put on the necklace that it contained and then opened the second and found its golden contents. The human had quickly hid the boxes and items to sell later and keep the money for himself, but the effects of the necklace he was wearing were already starting to take their effect. From what Plagueis had been able to discover, the necklace was for use in rituals and designed to enhance the dark side connection of its wearer. He had discovered it years before but hadn't had much time to study it. The effects that it had on a being that wasn't aligned with the dark side were immediate conversion. However, the effects on a being that wasn't even force-sensitive were usually complete madness and conversion to the dark side. The later had occurred in this case, and the effects were stronger than Plagueis thought they would be. He had never worn the necklace as he could not determine if it would be dangerous for him to wear it or not. Many ancient Sith amulets were made for a single user and prevented others from using them. The method of prevention ranged from a curse, conversion to the dark side in the case of a light side user, a plague, instant death, and possible possession if the amulet still had the essence of its creator. Given these possibilities, Plagueis had decided to never wear the necklace until he was sure he could use it effectively and safely. The crew member was not able to handle the surge of the dark side force energies and nearly killed everyone on board while setting the ship on some unknown course. At that point, Plagueis had been unable to act as the only remaining crew was the captain and he would have had to come into contact with the holocron in order to be possessed by him. Instead, the captain had packed everything that he could into an escape pod and abandoned the ship. For the next seven years, Plagueis was trapped in the ship and left to ponder his own thoughts. During that time, he had realized that revenge against Sidious would give him nothing and that what had happened to him was not unique in the rule of two. He had become too immersed in his own work and not paid enough attention to the doings of his apprentice. He had strayed from the goals of the Sith in order to further his own research. Looking back, he was surprised that Sidious waited as long as he did before killing him. He was still angry about his apprentice not actually facing him, but rather killing him in his sleep. For those seven, he had waited in the tomb-like ship for someone to find him. The probability of being found was incredibly slim though. The ship was deep in the unknown region, it could have crashed on any number of planets, and the number of habitable worlds with intelligent life was probably incredibly scarce in that region of the galaxy. It seemed an incredibly strange series of events that had led him to the planet he was marooned on. The odds of every being found were astronomical and yet he had been found. A small boy had found the ship and managed, with a little help, to get aboard. Plagueis had two options for leaving. He could possess or convince the boy to take his holocron outside or he could get to the medical droid and use a force ability called Mechidaru to reprogram it to follow his commands. Seeing as he didn't want to scare the boy away, 
He had hidden his presence from being sensed and hidden his spirit from being seen. Having seven years to discovery all that he could do while in spirit form, he found that he could not move very far from his holocrine and thus could not get to the droid to reprogram it. He needed someone or something to move his holocrine. The child turned out not to be the brightest star in the galaxy and obviously the boy's planet possessed only rudimentary technology at best, as the ship was so alien to him. Before the boy had a chance to accidentally kill himself with the blaster he was pointing at his own face, Playguys had intervened and attracted the child's attention to the holocrons. Unfortunately, like the crew member, the boy was more interested in the boxes and hadn't touched his holocron. While the first necklace had been dangerous to some, the golden necklace was dangerous to everyone that touched or wore it. With Playguys's limited ability to use the force in his current situation he was unable to stop the boy from putting on the necklace. After that, he calculated that it was just a matter of minutes before he would die a most horrible death. The plan therefore changed to having the boy to take his holocron to the medical droid. Surprisingly, it took nearly an hour for the child to finally succumb to the effects of the necklace. Far longer than he anticipated. Only the person that created the necklace could actually wear it. Everyone else who tried was slowly killed as their body was destroyed from the inside out. Playguys was fortunate that the boy had grabbed his holocron before completely succumbing to the effects of the necklace. He quickly found that a language barrier existed between them but he was able to plant suggestions in the child's mind to remove the necklace and go to the infirmary. Despite his holocron being on the floor, Playguys was close enough to the medical droid to be able to activate it and alter its programming to get it to take him away from the ship. He would have initiated his plan but his curiosity and the scientist in him had gotten the better of him, and he wanted to know how the child was able to survive exposure to the necklace for so long. Playguys did feel something odd about the boy when he had touched his holocron, but he just passed it off as the boy having extremely low force sensitivity. Now, however, he wasn't so sure, though. Using his force ability, he manipulated the droid to take a blood sample. The droid had then gone about taking standard measures to heal and save the boy. When the scavengers had raided his facility, they took everything that he had in his infirmary, which included the droid, medical supplies, back to tank, and even instruments. Therefore, the infirmary now had a blood scanner that could determine the boy's midichlorian count to satisfy his curiosity. He had no doubt that the boy would die as no one had ever survived wearing the necklace, and the boy had worn it for so long that the damage must have been extensive to his body and cells. The droid still followed its standard programming and hooked up a transfusion as well as several other IVs to try and stabilize the boy, then it had put him into the Bacta tank. The Bacta was doing its job of repairing his body but with the blood loss and damage to organs, should have been impossible for a human to survive. Once the droid was finished with its work, which Playguys allowed because he was patent, it took the sample of blood and ran it through the scanner. It only took a few seconds to scan for just about everything that would be present in the boy's blood. The results were finished and the droid said in a robotic voice, no midichlorians found. Playguys was confused for a moment. What the droid just told him was impossible. The device must be malfunctioning. He thought as that was the obvious answer. Midichlorians were present in the cells of all life, and it was believed that they were needed for life to even exist. Values per cell could range from less than 2,000 per cell which wasn't uncommon for some humanids. An amount of about 2,500 per cell was considered average for humanids, and with this amount they were not force-sensitive. A being with a count of around 5,000 was sensitive to the force and beings with between 5,000 and less than 20,000 were able to both detect and use the force. The boy was admittedly near death but that should have no bearing on his midichlorian count. He told the droid to get another sample and test again. The droid followed his wishes but the results came up the same. Playguys had the droid look through everything else in the room to see if there was another device that could do the test. The droid couldn't find anything else. Getting an idea, Playguys had the droid test some of the blood packets that were taken from his infirmary. He only stocked blood from beings that had higher midichlorian counts and even had blood from a Jedi that he had come across and killed. That blood was what the boy was currently getting so the droid tested several other packets and came back with the expected readings for each packet. The only conclusions that Playguys could come up with to explain the phenomenon was that either 
the boy didn't have any midichlorians, which was impossible, or that something in his blood was interfering with the readings. The scan, however, didn't detect any anomalies besides some different antibodies in the blood which would be normal for a different planet. Playguys ordered another sample taken so that he could look at it on the microscope that was also taken from his infirmary. The droid complied and took the sample. Magnifying the sample to incredible levels gave a view of a part of the cell that wasn't normally seen. While midichlorians were incredibly small, technology could still see them. The magnification of the sample was brought up on the screen, and Playguys saw something that he didn't expect. What he saw was an absence of midichlorians. The boy cells didn't have any. The cells should have several thousand and they should be visible at this magnification but no matter where the viewer moved in the cells, there just weren't any of the organisms present. Playguys stared at the monitor and looked in confusion. Everything that he knew about midichlorians had just been questioned. What he was seeing wasn't supposed to be possible. He told the droid to reduce the magnification so that he could look at more of an entire cell. He stared at the viewer and saw something that he just didn't expect. The cell seemed to have some kind of vein-like structure in it that was glowing a light blue and emanated from a small node in the middle of the cell. It stretched the entire length of the cell. He had the droid reduce the magnification again so that he could look at multiple cells and notice that they were all the same. Deep in thought, Playguys had an idea. He asked the droid for a tissue sample this time. What he saw was rather interesting. The tissue sample was very standard as it had several layers of cells all bundled together. However, each cell had a node as well as a vein that went out of the cell and seemed to merge with the veins from the other cells to form a larger vein. From this, Pleasures began to build a hypothesis about what he was seeing. He knew that the force was an energy field that surrounded and penetrated all things. A high concentration of midichlorians gave a being the ability to detect and manipulate this energy field. From what he felt from the boy and what he was seeing on the monitor, the cells of his body seemed to have their own energy field and produced their own energy that traveled through the body in pathways or veins that combined with each other to form larger veins. He was positive that they might form an even larger pathway that seemed to mimic the body's circulatory system, similar to capillaries and veins for blood to travel through. Since nearly every cell was linked or in contact with the energy field, the energy probably circulated through the body similar to the blood. The energy could possibly even control or regulate the functions of the body. It was an amazing phenomenon that he would never have thought existed. More than anything, he wanted to study and learn about what he was seeing on the monitor. Was the energy field and energy different from the force? Could it be harnessed and manipulated like the force? If so, what kind of abilities developed from it? Did other people have this or was the boy special in some way? He wanted to know. He had myriad of questions that he wanted answered. This boy and perhaps even this uncharted planet had turned out to be far more interesting than he ever would have thought. Of course, that all depended on if he survived. Otherwise, he would have to find someone else. Turning to the boy, he ordered the droid to focus all of its efforts on trying to save his life. Amazingly enough, after a few more minutes of treatment from the droid, the monitors indicated that his condition was actually stabilizing. The boy had lost a large amount of blood due to severe internal bleeding and yet, without even using up a third of the blood transfusion bag, he was already on his way to making a recovery. Playguys knew that even with Bacta and a blood transfusion, this type of regeneration would take several times longer than it had. His organs didn't fail, his body didn't bleed out, and despite the damage, it seemed he would make a full recovery. Playguys was determined to find out all he could about what he had just seen and since the boy wasn't going anywhere for a while, he would have time to look through the boy's mind in order to find some answers and satisfy some of his questions and burning curiosity. He would also need to establish communication and perhaps learn the local language. Chapter 3 Plejuis continued to plan a strategy for what to do. He had always been a planner and never jumped into anything without thinking it out. Most of the thoughts that went through his head concerned the blonde boy in the back to tank in front of him. It had been minutes since he discovered that the boy had no midichlorians, and since then he had run every test that he could with the instruments that he had. The boy's recovery rate was phenomenal. So far, there was no hint of infection, and despite having several of his organs damaged, 
they were repairing themselves with the aid of the Bacta. The boy was fast on his way to recovery from wounds and damage that would have killed others. The only thing he could find wrong with the boy was some malnutrition. Play guys determined that the boy had several differences compared with regular humans. His body was stronger and had the potential to gain immense strength due to differences in the muscle tissue. His joints were far stronger and durable, meaning that he could survive immense falls and land without a problem. His nervous system was superior as was his hand-eye coordination and he could probably react faster than a normal human. The reasoning for these differences most likely had to do with whatever energy, an energy field that his body was producing. He thought he felt something off about the boy when he first felt him and it was actually the boy's energy field which wasn't repelling the energy field of the force but was actually a barrier to it and prevented it from entering the boy's body. It was similar to a person wearing a rain coat while walking through a rainstorm and never getting wet. The coat wasn't forcing the water away from the body but was a barrier that inhibited it from getting the person wet. The boy's energy was exiting his body through various regulatory points along the pathway and creating the energy field which kept the energy field of the force away from him. This created a small buildup of the force on the barrier which had lead to him believing that it was minor force sensitivity. If had tried to sense beyond the barrier, he would have found a void in the force. Playguys found it difficult to actually sense the boy's energy as it was similar to the force but different enough that he had to try rather hard to sense it, and he deduced that his current proximity to the boy also played a factor. Playguys' thoughts then turned to what he would do after the boy woke up. He would have to determine everything that he could about the boy while asleep and probe his mind before making a decision. If possible, he wanted to learn as much as possible about the energy the boy had and would offer his own knowledge about the ship and possibly universe in exchange. The boy obviously had no need to learn the force as his body couldn't use it, but he was incredibly curious about the starship and would probably either tell Playguys everything that he wanted to know or acquired this information for him. However, the boy was still rather young and it was definitely possible that he didn't know much about the energy that his body produced. Moving towards the Bacta tank, Playguys extended his arm. It phased through the tube as he was a spirit, and no longer had a physical body. He had to concentrate in order for his hand to become solid again and make physical contact with the boy's head. Using his abilities in draining knowledge and reading thoughts, Playguys searched the boy's mind to find the information that he is looking for. While using these techniques, he began to feel a pulling sensation. Initially he tried to resist but the pull got stronger and he found it difficult to concentrate on searching for the information he wanted, while also resisting the unknown force. Giving into his curiosity, Playguys stopped resisting the pull. A moment later, Playguys found himself in an underground tunnel system or sewer. No longer an apparition, he discovered that he had a complete body and feet to move. The sewer had several inches of water, and he was instantly aware that he wasn't alone. For a brief moment, he wondered if what he was feeling was the boy but it felt different. Where I am, were his thoughts as he knew that this wasn't the boy's mind. Gliding through the water and towards the disturbance that he felt, he passed many dark passageways off the main corridor that he was on. Following the disturbance, he made a turn off the main route and entered a very large room. Before him was a large golden gate with many bars which stretched up to the darkened ceiling high above. The water extended into the cage and Playguys was aware that he was being watched. One large red eye was open in the cage and the slit red pupil was watching him. He couldn't make out just what the eye was attached to as the darkness in the cage shrouded whatever was watching him. Not knowing anything about the creature before him, or why exactly it was caged inside of the boy he asked it a question, where am I? Playguys wasn't sure if he would get a response to his question but a moment later, a deep voice responded in an unfamiliar language. Surprised, Playguys took a moment to determine what he should do. Since the creature was able to talk, it would be beneficial to find out everything that it knew. However, he would first need to solve the language barrier. He could have used his abilities on the creature but thought better of it as he knew nothing about it or what it was capable of. Playguys could clearly feel its malevolence and power which greatly surpassed his own and anything that he had ever encountered before. It was a good idea not to anger it until he knew more. Walking out of the room, Playguys looked down the directions that he could take. 
He used the force to make a decision and went in the direction that he didn't come from. He was looking for the boy's mind but that room obviously wasn't it. He surmised that this was some type of representation of the boy's body and therefore he had to follow the pathways to get to the mind. Normally the techniques that he used didn't involve anything like what he was experiencing. He usually probed the mind while staying in his own body slash spirit and not having his consciousness pulled into the being he was probing. Then again, the boy wasn't connected to the force and had a unique energy produced by his own body, so there were bound to be differences. Play guys walked through the sewer until he found the correct passage that he was looking for. He stepped into the darkness of the passageway. Emerging into another room, he found a small ledge and a very large body of water in front of him. Inside of the water was what he was looking for. A set of stair led right into the water so he walked down them. Play guys found that he didn't need to breath and the water offered almost no resistance to him. He walked forward and got closer to the very large brain that the force told him was here. It was the representation of all the boy's knowledge and thoughts and had several large scrolls inserted into it. All play guys needed to do was place his hand on it and find the information that he wanted. Play guys once again entered the room with the cage. The eye once again opened to stare at him and he again asked his question but this time in the same language as the creature and boy used, where is this place? After hearing a brief chuckling from the create, it responded with, inside of the seal. Play guys was confused by this as he didn't know what the creature meant by seal but he didn't let it bother him as he would find out eventually. What exactly are you? I can't see anything except your eye but I'm quite sure I've never seen anything similar to you. Admitted play guys as he remained honest until such time as he would need to tell a lie or hold information back. The creature chuckled again and said I could ask you the very same question. You don't look or feel like the humans I've seen. I am the QB no Kitsune. And an outline of the creature was revealed when it manipulated its own energy which poured off its body in a deep red color. Play Guys was curious about the name as it sounded more like a title, but the display of power was the most intriguing aspect of their exchange. The sheer hatred and malice that poured off the creature was astounding. It isn't even displaying the full power available to it. He realized but wasn't going to show any signs that he was intimidated. From what he could tell with the Force, the beast was rather intelligent, and he might be able to subdue it with the Force while it was in its cage but he knew he couldn't fight it if it was not in the cage. It would be best to talk with it before trying anything else, he reasoned. Play guys tried to categorize the creature from things that he had heard about but nothing compared. It seemed to be composed of the same energy the boy had but it was infinitely more powerful and possessed a sharp mind from what play guys could determine with the force. If play guys didn't know any better, he would have thought that it was a being composed entirely of the dark side. I am known as Darth Plagueis, Lord of the Sith. I'm not exactly from around these parts, so I have never heard of you before. I would like to know about you and hear anything that you would care to talk about, especially concerning this planet and the power that its people, as well as you yourself, possess, said Plagueis. A few minutes earlier, inside of the seal, the QB opened one of its eyes to see who had come to visit him. He didn't think it was his container, as he could feel great malice and hatred coming from the figure, but he knew it wasn't Achi Hamadara or anyone else that he had ever encountered before. The figure entered the room with the cage and then spoke in an unknown language. The QB answered with, speak some sense or leave, in a dull voice. It was rather curious though as it never expected anyone to enter the seal for quite some time to come and wondered why did they speak another language. The strangest part was that this person also didn't seem to have chakra but possessed something else. The man left and went out of the seal into the boy's mind. The QB was slightly concerned as if the boy died then he would die. He had already felt his jailer nearly die from some unknown attack. He thought perhaps the man could have been responsible but was unsure. There wasn't anything he could do as his jailer had yet to access any of his chakra and the seal was as solid as when it was first placed. He just hoped that his run of a jailer wouldn't get himself killed by doing something stupid. It was embarrassing enough to have such a child as his container. After a period of time, the man returned but this time spoke in words that the QB could understand. They conversed for quite some time. Hours passed while they spoke of many different topics. 
The QB had been interested to know about the galaxy and all of the other planets and species that inhabited it. He rather enjoyed it when he was told by Playguys that he had seen or heard of no other being that could rival his power in the galaxy. In turn, the QB provided information about the boy and about Chakra. He told Playguys about what it could do, how it was made, and about the ninjas that used it. The seal was mentioned in Fuinjutsu, along with information about the boy's parents. Play guys had been unable to find much about this knowledge while looking through the boy's mind, so this information was very valuable. Play guys left after his most immediate questions were answered but said that he would return to talk again. The QB was actually looking forward to it. Back in the ship. Opening his eyes, Play guys found himself back in his spirit form. He idly noticed that the blood transfusion bag was just as full as when he had left and asked the droid about it. To his surprise, the droid responded that it was the same bag that he started with. Asking the droid again, this time about how long he had been in contact with the boy, the droid responded that he touched the boy's head for only a few seconds. I spent hours talking with the vulpine creature, yet only seconds passed out here. How interesting. He thought as his mind starting working on how he could use this to his advantage. He also noticed that although he was inside the boy's mind, his body there still retained his connection to the Force. It probably had something to do with my spirit being in contact with the boy. He believed that the barrier the boy's energy field created wasn't very powerful and could be pierced by the Force, given some coaxing, but under normal circumstances wouldn't. If he was going to get back to the rest of the galaxy or at least some form of civilization, he would need several things to happen and a good amount of preparation. Playguys wanted to study this planet, as well as its mysteries, as much as possible but he really didn't have the equipment or resources to do this. Therefore he would have to get back to the known galaxy and acquire such resources. He had a ship but it didn't have any fuel, at least not enough to even get him off the planet. More fuel would have to be created or another power source obtained. The level of technology that the planet possessed was rather primitive, and it would be exceedingly difficult to find any power source that would be able to power the ship. Play guys just hoped that the fuel wasn't something incredibly exotic like hypermatter. It was also possible that the crash had damaged the ship in some way. Everything would have to be thoroughly checked. As much as he didn't want to admit it, he would need help. Someone would have to work on getting the fuel or alternative power source and determine if anything was damaged on the ship. Playguys would also need someone to pilot the ship as he couldn't do it, and a medical droid wasn't suited for that kind of task. The boy in the back to tank could provide what he needed. He wouldn't really be an apprentice but more like an assistant, servant, or pawn. He would need to teach the boy though, which could take a while and in meantime he could have the boy bring him more information about chakra and jutsu. An arrangement could easily be made with seemingly mutually beneficial terms. From what Playguys could tell from the boy's mind, he was desperate to be noticed and acknowledged by anyone and everyone around him. He also had much hatred for the villagers but had fixated the dream of trying to get them to acknowledge him and becoming the leader of the village. The boy had chosen all the wrong reasons to do this. He had no idea what would be in store for him in running a village of any size and it was a foolish dream of a child seeking attention. Even with the determination that the boy had, deep down he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to do it. The boy buried all of these doubts, anger and hatred but it couldn't be gotten rid of and was there for play guys to find. It would be rather easy for him to play on those fears and hatred. He could turn the boy into his servant and against the village that hated him. Playguys had all the information that he needed to do it. The QB creature had been most helpful, as were the boy's own memories. It seemed as though the Force had provided him with all that he needed to solve the problems that he was facing. If only the boy could have been a little smarter. Inside of Naruto's body As new blood flowed into Naruto's veins, his body had decided that it was foreign, as the cells had no chakra, and therefore could be dangerous so it sought to neutralize the incoming cells. The cells, which were full of midichlorians, were destroyed one by one. Instead of just dying though, the remains of the cells were recycled to help the body. While midichlorians were not transferable to another person and force sensitivity couldn't be acquired through a blood transfusion, 
Naruto's body didn't know that or cared as it started using the leftover cell mass to repair its damaged areas. Chakra poured into the damaged areas and went to work repairing them. The midichlorians present in the cells were attracted to the chakra, specifically the chakra network, and they were either placed into damaged cells or hitched a ride on the chakra pathways and followed them to new cells that were undamaged. Apparently the midichlorians liked their new home, but they were unable to feel a connection with the force so they lie dormant. More blood had been transferred into Naruto as the monitors indicated that the initial amount wasn't enough and his red blood cell count was still rather low. As more foreign blood entered his body, the same process happened until every cell in his body had midichlorians in them. At some point, the process stopped though. It was as if the midichlorians had decided that they didn't want a higher concentration in the cells they were in. Also the Jedi blood that was being used had run out, and the blood another force sensitive was being used. Perhaps the midichlorians from the Jedi just didn't want to share their cells with other midichlorians from someone else. This process would ultimately leave Naruto with somewhere around 9,000 midichlorians per cell in his body which was that of a Jedi who had average force sensitivity. When the midichlorians first entered his cells, they were not able to feel the force due to the barrier caused by the energy field produced by the boy's body. However, that all changed when Playguys made physical contact with the boy. When Playguys entered the boy's mindscape, he was able to use the force because he brought it through the barrier. While the barrier was able to stop the force from entering Naruto's body it was by no means a brick wall. It wasn't very rigid or sturdy at all. Plejiz's trip into Naruto's seal and mind created an opening in that barrier. The midichlorians weren't able to bring the force to them because all of the force energy that entered was being used by Playguys but once he was finished, a brief opening in the barrier was left. The opening started closing but it was enough for the midichlorians that were in the cells to feel the force and pull it to them. As more midichlorians entered and became part of Naruto's body, more force flowed through the hole in the barrier, and the midichlorians were able to alter the barrier to allow the force to enter without being hindered. It would take several hours for this entire process to finish. After that time had passed, Naruto would be able to feel and manipulate the force without problems when he woke up. The force now would naturally flow through his body, just like anyone else from the rest of the known galaxy. Playguys had been silently plotting his next steps for over an hour. The problem he faced was that he needed the boy's help but he was a Sith and wasn't going to admit that he needed anyone's help. He determined what he was going to talk about with the boy and what things to say in order to bring the boy over to his side. The only obstacle that he could think of was that the boy was rather superstitious and that he was terribly afraid of ghosts. Playguys was a spirit but had the exact look of a classic ghost. The effect was only worsened by the fact that he wasn't human. He was immune, so he couldn't show his face at all until after explaining things and would need to remain cloaked. From looking through his memories, Playguys knew that the boy had never even considered the thought that the stars in the sky were part of other systems with planets and different species. Possibly no one from his planet had that thought either. It was a lot to take in but with everything combined together, it was definitely enough to scare the boy off. He didn't want the boy to run screaming off the ship and never return, or worse, run screaming off the ship and bring others back. The last thing that Playguys wanted was to be used or have his holocron destroyed as it was the only thing keeping him in this world. His force powers were limited at best, and he really didn't have a good way to defend himself. The powers of Sith spirits always varied. It depended on many factors which included the power of the person before they died, how much anger they held on to, and the location where they were at. If they were in an area strong in the dark side then the spirits would be stronger. Playguys was not in a favorable position at all. He would have to use the holocron to his advantage. The hologram it produced was an image of the upper portion of his body, and would allow him to speak through it while his spirit watched from the shadows and stayed out of sight. Playguys had no doubt in his mind that the activated holocron would catch the boy's attention and interest. It was during this contemplation that he began to feel something. He didn't even register it at first because he was so deep in thought but as it grew, he finally took notice of it. Turning to the back to tank, he felt with the force and found something rather strange. The boy's energy field was no longer impeding the force. That doesn't make any sense. He thought and cautiously approached the tank. 
The boy was still unconscious but he could feel the force moving through him, and yet the other energy was still there as well. Curious, he told the droid to collect another blood sample and perform another midichlorian count. The droid confirmed Playguys' suspicions when it told him that the blood tested at an average of 9,000 midichlorians per cell. The boy goes from no midichlorians to 9,000 in a matter of hours. I would say that it was impossible, but I've had a great many impossibilities happen today. Now I have something else to consider. He thought as he stared at the tank. If the boy was able to use the force, then he could make him his apprentice. However, it was against the rules of the Sith though as Sidious had killed him in the rite of ascension and was now a master of the Sith and would train his own apprentice. The rule of two didn't necessarily account for a situation like this though. I would have to gain more of the boy's trust and loyalty if I was to teach him the ways of the Force as well as just teaching him about technology. It would also be better as he could protect the ship and himself with the Force, especially since I know little of using chakra. Perhaps you won't be my apprentice but maybe a Sith acolyte or something along those lines. I wouldn't teach him enough to be a true apprentice. I am very curious to see what he would be capable of with the Force and this other power that he has. Decided play guys and he made his decision, he would train the boy. Naruto's eyes opened to look up at a strange light fixture that he had never seen before. He looked around and found himself in the room that he told himself he would never go back into. The suit of armor was gone. He sat up and examined himself as memories of what happened flooded back to him. He quickly checked his nose, eyes, and ears but no blood was present. There wasn't even any dried blood either. He felt a little strange and he had a bad headache. Thinking perhaps it had all been a dream, he got off the table and his stomach growled. How long had it been since he had eaten? As he left the infirmary, he never stopped to think how he had gotten on the table in the first place as he had fallen on the floor. Food was the only thing he had on his mind now. Walking into a hallway, he was about to go back to the tube that he had come through so he could get back home when he noticed a light down the hallway. The light was in the area with the table and seats, but the room lights weren't on. Cautiously, Naruto walked down the hallway and the lights in the room turned on with his movement, but this no longer surprised him. He looked at the table and saw that the pyramid object that he had earlier was sitting on the table, and it was glowing red. Above the object, the image of a person was detailed in the red light. The individual was cloaked and Naruto could barely make out his chin, let alone the rest of his face. There was no way to determine what he actually looked like or skin tone because the hologram was just a shade of red. The image was only ten or so inches high, and the figure seemed to be staring at him. Naruto was incredibly curious, as he had never seen anything like what the pyramid was doing. The hologram sat still as Naruto slowly approached. Before Naruto reached the table, it spoke, Greetings, young one. It said in a dull, nasally voice. Naruto jumped when he heard the voice and looked around the room until his eyes came back to the hologram. He didn't know what to think about the device. It seemed similar to his television, but it didn't have a screen and was red. He then began to wonder how it managed to get out here when he was sure he left it somewhere else. Yes, I am talking to you from this device and no, I am not some type of recording. Naruto for his part just stared at the device. How? Naruto started but he was interrupted by the voice. At this point it would be a waste of time to explain it to you as you don't have any grasp on technology, especially something so advanced as this. You should just talk to me like I was any normal person as I can see and hear you as well as you can see and hear me. Stated the voice, and the image barely moved. Who are you? Naruto asked while not taking his eyes away from the device. He was rather suspicious of it, and afraid of what was going on. Ah, yes. Your customs are to for me to introduce myself, and then you reciprocate. My name is Darth Plagiris, Lord of the Sith. It stated. Naruto stared at the device for a second as he didn't know what reciprocate meant, or what the man's title meant so he just gave his name as well, Uzumaki Naruto. Future Hokage. The image didn't move but Play Guys tried not to roll his eyes at the response. Well, Naruto... It seems that you have stumbled onto something. I knew it was important. Naruto yelled in triumph, and Playguys' image tried to remain calm. Actually it isn't, and it does belong to me. He stated and the boy quieted down immediately. 
You probably thought that this ship was worth something but I'm afraid to tell you that it isn't something that can be sold since it wouldn't have a price. It is an interesting discovery, but you can't sell it to anyone because it belongs to me. If you told anyone, they might try and steal it from me, especially the government of your village. They would probably keep it a secret and take everything that I have for themselves, stated Play Guys. Naruto was sure whether he wanted to believe what the image said or not. Would the old man really take this away from Play Guys and keep everything a secret? He didn't think so but wasn't sure. Naruto did have a question about something the man had said. Wait, you said ship? So it is a boat? Asked Naruto confused. No, this ship is far more advanced than a simple boat. It's meant for something much more amazing than that, said Play Guys. So what is it? What does it do? Can I see it in action? Asked Naruto all at once. Play Guys didn't allow the image to show his inner smirk and said, I'm afraid not. You see, it isn't working right now and we need to be fixed first. And it's not worth anything? No, I'm afraid not and I'm not selling it. Besides, it's far too heavy to remove from the lake bed anyway, and no one else would even know what to do with it. What about that golden necklace? Naruto protested. You mean the one that nearly killed you? Which caused Naruto to instantly quiet in shock and play guys continued, Yes, the memories that you have are true. You nearly died from putting it on. That necklace has a very powerful and deadly curse associated with it, and if it wasn't for me then you would have died. I acquired it some time ago and tried to put it away safely in those boxes, but evidently it wasn't safe enough. He stated. Um, thanks, I guess, and I'm sorry. Stated Naruto while looking away from the image and down at the floor. Play guys merely nodded his head. It's all right, no harm done. He stated as he was first trying to build up some trust between them and make sure that Naruto wouldn't tell anyone about the ship as he was playing it off as being rather worthless. It wasn't a lie though. No one in his village would be able to use the ship and they might not even be able to get it out of the lake, much less back to the village for study. I was wondering, would you like to learn more about this ship and its workings? I could teach you. Inquired Play Guys. Naruto's eyes widened at the statement, He would teach me something? You'd teach me? Naruto blurted out. Yes, of course I would be willing to teach you. After all, you did discover this ship and took the time to learn to swim and investigate it to get here. It's the least I could do. However, you would have to keep this as our little secret. I wouldn't want anyone else to find out. They might get jealous or not think you deserve to learn what I can teach you. I've seen the way they look at you in the village. You definitely don't deserve it. Stated Play Guys in the most fake sincere voice that he could. Naruto was surprised to hear about the offer and saddened when Play Guys mentioned the villagers and his treatment in the village. Would they really stop me from coming here to learn? Naruto never even stopped to think of how it was that Play Guys knew about the villagers and the way they treat him. Play Guys could see that he was slowly winning over the boy and he had plenty of ammunition left. No one deserves to be treated like that, especially for something that they didn't do and that wasn't even their fault. Naruto instantly looked up at the statement, he knows why they hate me? Why? Why do they all look down on me and treat me the way they do? Tell me? Yelled Naruto desperately as he had wanted to know for years. Oh, you mean you don't know? They never told you? Play guys asked in as surprised and concerned a voice as he could manage. They? was Naruto's response as he didn't understand why it was a plural. Yes, the whole village has a reason why they hate you so much, but I'm surprised they never bothered to even tell you. Not even the Hokage told you about it? asked Blizzries with fake shock. The old man knows too? How terrible. The man you trusted the most didn't want to tell you why the entire village hates you. I suppose he had his reasons though. It's his fault why they all know in the first place. Stated Play Guys. Naruto was about to say something when the words died in his mouth. The old man knew all along, and he just lied to me over and over again. Why is it his fault that the village knows? Thought Naruto, but he wanted to know why the villagers hated him first. That question had been eating away at him for years. Why do they hate me? Tell me? Naruto yelled, but the end part came out as more of an order. Play Guys was slightly taken by surprise as the boy had actually used the force in his words to make them an order, 
and it would have actually coerced a civilian to tell him what he wanted to know. It didn't work on Play Guys though but it was still interesting. He could feel the anger building in the boy and knew exactly how to bring it to the surface. You see, started Play Guys and he continued to explain the details of the ceiling, the QB, and even showed him the seal on his stomach for proof. He had gotten the information straight from the source and a little bit more. The Vulpine was aware of a few things that went on outside of the seal. It was aware that the Hokage had given a speech concerning the sealing of it into the boy because of all the hatred and malice that had been directed at its container on that night. It knew exactly what the Hokage had said and the reaction from the village. Play Guys explained everything about the sealing to Naruto as best as he could. He himself had barely learned about only a few hours ago, but had no difficulty explaining it to a child. The nuances still eluded him, but the boy didn't need such exact details at the moment. After the explanation on the ceiling, he retold what the QB had told him about the Sandame telling the entire village about the ceiling. Why? Naruto said at the end of the speech and Plagues could tell that the single word was grasping for many different answers. I'm afraid he just doesn't trust you enough. The Hokage must not think you can keep a secret like that and just lied to make you stop questioning it. I'm not sure why he told all the villagers about the ceiling. It seems rather imbecilic thing to do to a child. As for the villagers, I think that has to do with the Hokage trying to keep them quiet to cover up for his mistake. I'm not completely positive on that though, but it does make sense. Whatever it is, it certainly doesn't stop them from treating you like dirt or prevent them from hurting you. And this burden that you were forced to bear certainly doesn't give them the right to treat you so horribly. Stated Play Guys in a kind tone. No, it doesn't, thought Naruto as he had many close calls with the villagers at the time of his birthday. In general, the majority of the village had treated him horribly. He was incredibly saddened by what he was told but he was also angry. If the villagers knew that it wasn't his fault then why did they hate him so much? He didn't choose to have the QB sealed inside of him. It was all the Yandames doing, yet they praised him for doing it. It wasn't fair and it pissed him off. As much as Play Guys wanted the boy's anger to come to the surface and fester, he had other business to take care of as well. Regardless, I would still be willing to teach you what I know about this ship. Unlike the village and Hokage, your burden doesn't bother me. I might even teach you more than that. I happen to know of very special abilities that aren't possessed by just anyone. I can tell that you have the gift, and I could teach you how to use those abilities if you would help me in return? Suggested Play Guys. What would I have to help you with? Asked Naruto as he was very interested in learning Jutsu and if this guy or whatever the heck he was, was offering to teach him then he wanted to know what he had to do. Well, as I said before, this ship is rather damaged and I would need some help repairing it. That is where the knowledge that I wanted to teach you about the ship comes in. I would teach you about it, and then you might be able to help me. I would even be willing to teach you about the abilities that I know. How does that sound? Asked Play Guys in a serious voice. So, you teach me about Jutsu and stuff? Asked Naruto and Play Guys responded, I'm afraid not. I really don't know much about chakra or jutsu. What I'm willing to teach you is different from these things but very unique in its own way. I can guarantee that no one in the village has ever seen or knows about what I can teach. It would be something of your very own. Of course you would have to keep this a secret between us. If people found out about you learning something that they know nothing about, they would be incredibly jealous. I doubt that anyone would want you to know something so unique. They would probably demand that someone else be taught, someone who was more deserving in their eyes. You shouldn't mention it to the Hokage either, as I'm not sure if he would want you learning from me either. Would these abilities make me powerful? Asked Naruto seriously. Yes, you could become quite powerful from learning and using what I can teach you. You could even still learn chakra and jutsu as well. You'd be able to have something that no one else did said Plejuis. He could already see that the boy would agree to his terms. The trust that had once been with the Hokage had now been moved to him, and he could already feel the boy's loyalty changing. With some time, he would be able to mold the boy to be the perfect servant, and then he would be able to get back to civilization and get the resources necessary to study this planet and its people. Play guys didn't have to worry about time though, as he had all the time in the world. 
If needed, he could always increase the boy's lifespan with his midichlorian manipulation. It was possible that he could be stuck here for a long time. It all depended on the damage to the ship and acquiring slash making a fuel source. It would normally take years or even decades to teach the Naruto what he needed to know but play guys had already been thinking about that. When he was in the boy's mind, there was a strange time difference, and perhaps he could use that to his advantage. He had to teach Naruto about language, technology, how to think properly, how to use the force, and how to fight. He would also have to remove the frivolous notions of becoming the leader of the village and remove the boy's boasting and loudness. Most of the emotions had to go as well. He would teach Naruto how to harness and wield his emotions and not let them overpower him. Naruto would also need to be taught to think like a Sith. It was obvious that Naruto's mind would need a great deal of time and effort to get him up to where Playguys felt a servant of his should be. It just might be possible though, and Playguys was very interested in trying. He wouldn't make the same mistakes that he did with Sidious. Until he would be able to properly study this planet, he would have to settle for training Naruto and learning all that he could from him. The ship might not be the best place to stay as the power was dwindling, and it would be difficult for Naruto to keep sneaking out of the village. The ship wasn't flat on the bottom of the lake either and was at a slight angle which made it less ideal for most physical exercises and teaching. Also, someone was bound to get suspicious about where Naruto was always going when he went outside the village. The ship had to be kept hidden and safe but his holocron was first priority.